eighth person signed the examiner and proctor affidavit indicating, indicating um, that they had witnessed SOL violation. Were these witnesses interviewed? If so, why did I receive the redact transcription? Okay, I did not get those. Also, when you have uh, 63 signed test security forms, 47 signed SOL training form, 25 signed examiner's clock affidavit, so the numbers don't come together. They don't jive. So some people were involved in some testing, and they were not. They were not certified in training. So I think those matters need to be dealt with, and dealt with particularly by this board, because the buck stopped with this board. Thank you so much for your time, Chairman and Member of the Board. Thank you, speaking as an individual. Um, I'm back from last year speaking about the five extra hours for no compensation. Uh, I'm not here to pick out my school. Um, it's a wonderful school, wonderful principal, wonderful staff. These are general, general, general remarks. Um, our staff uh, found out on Sunday the 23rd that as of September the 26th and thereafter, teachers would be reporting at 8 o'clock for 9 o'clock opening. And uh, this is a communication I got from one of our very best teachers in RPS, in my view. She's, uh, she or he is uh, someone who's been honored, has held statewide office in the professional organization. Uh, hey Tom, we just got a message from our principal that we are supposed to report from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So that means we're working an extra hour every day. I think this is total bull. <laughs> Sorry for my language. Somehow I just knew that RPS would screw us over, and if this is true, they will be losing me as an educator after next year. I don't do sneaky and underhanded. Then a couple days later from the same amazingly good teacher. Thank you so much. I was really excited to come back with our staff and students, but I'm now so disheartened before even stepping a foot back in the door. I believe in professional development. I do a ton of it on my own because I cannot get what I need from our school and RPS. I just want to be treated as a professional with the power to choose. So I have an extra hour a day that probably has not much in it for me as try and complete a professional development program she's involved in. That just seems ridiculous. Uh, so our teachers are working an extra five hours uh, a day. We don't even know the situation in other schools. 30 seconds. Uh, are ours, do all schools have five extra hours? Rumor has it not. And rumor has it that some schools have an additional 90 minutes instead of 360 minutes. Uh, I'm going to say the word our. Our view is that we're hired by the school board. We're not employees of our principals. So it appears that the principals are the ones who are being allowed to set the length of the workday and the 
a work week. And uh, that's, we don't understand that. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Dr. Baby, Superintendent, and all other honorable members of the Richmond School Board. My name is Gregory Day, and I will be speaking today on behalf of the Richmond Coalition for Quality Education. Um, this past week, um, there were there was an issue that was brought to my attention. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this in advance. I'm hoping that it's already probably taken care of. Where I had a parent to contact me about the bus schedules. Um, she was telling me, I understand that school's hours have changed, 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock for my schools. But she told me that the bus schedule had not changed. And everything that we saw in the news was that if the um, schools, schools are changing uh, or changing the hours, because if kids sleep more, they'll learn better. Well, what she was telling me is that she don't see how. How in the world can children sleep longer if the bus schedule hasn't changed? And also what concerned her was that if the children get to school at the same time they've been getting to school, who's going to be there with the children? Um, when we had our banquet, one of the things, our banquet this year in June, one of the things that I, I vowed and I promised to Dr. Bed, and I meant this with everything in me, is that we're going to work together. We're not just going to jump on issues and just say, you know, blame a school board, blame Dr. Bed on nobody. My thing was to bring it to the attention of this board, because I don't know if there's been any corrections. I don't even know, uh, you know, what, if, if that is so, that the buses uh, are getting the children to school at the same time that they were getting there last year, and the times have changed, the start times have changed. So hopefully that somebody can get with the Richmond Coalition or get with me and let me know. Now, my school board representative is Ms. Taylor. And my first thing to do was to reach out to Ms. Taylor to find out what in the world is going on. Is this true? We didn't get into too much discussion because I felt that as my school board representative, she's my friend as well, and I didn't want to go that route. So I'm bringing the issue to you all, and hopefully that someone can tell me that the bus schedule has changed to get those high school children there at, a, at a 15 minutes before time school starts or something. They don't need to get there at 720. 7.15 and school doesn't start until 8 o'clock. And I did speak with a bus driver, one of the bus drivers, and they told me that nothing had changed. So I did reach out. Now, having said all of that, I want you to know we're gonna be doing things differently because we will be bringing the issues to you that come to us, hopefully, so we can work together to resolve any issues that are out there. We don't wanna take anything for granted. We don't wanna just be listening and, and, and we don't know what's true. So we'll be bringing issues to you. Hopefully we can work together to resolve some of those. Now again today, at about 3.30, <laughs> I got another call, and I'm hoping that this board can check on this, because I don't know if it's true or not. A parent asked me the procedures on open enrollment, and I said, I really can't answer that, I don't know, let me be in, I was at work. I need to be looking at some documents, looking at something, I don't want to go off the top of my head telling you about open enrollment. I do know open enrollment is for a child that's out of zone, but what the parent went to tell me <laughs> is that over at, uh, at Holton Elementary, that there is a student that Dr. Hudson has allowed to come to the school. The child is not, it's, it's out of zone, but they did not go through an open enrollment process. And it hurt me more when I was told that Mrs. Pinkney Epps was involved in that. So I'm asking this board if you all can check on that. We don't need any further stuff going on about Richmond Public Schools. You're doing some good things. I know Dr. Bed is going to do some good things. I've already, you know, we talked, and I meant that when I said that at our banquet. So hopefully, if someone can look into that. Please do. Please follow up with me. Anybody. My phone number is five zero two nine seven three one. As president of Richmond Coalition, please get back with me so I can let the organization know that we're working together, number one, and we can get back to people with answers. Now, if this has been resolved, if it's true, I don't know. I, 
I'm standing here. And this call came to me at 3.30 this evening, this afternoon. 30 seconds. So I'm asking that you all will look into those issues. Somebody get back with me, please, to let me know uh, how to proceed from this point. If not, we'll just follow up on uh, the best way that we possibly can. Thank you. Builders LLC. I'm here to have a uh, concern about the TBT program, therapeutic treatment program that's come up, coming up. And we got a brief of the new process. Um, I'm here just to kind of represent youth builders right now to speak on what we do in the school. And as we, um, when things is coming out, the people kind of starting to hear a little buzz going around. So I'm here to try to state my case and some other providers. Um, again, um, the process that we've known now that the principals and the CIS coordinator was really wasn't involved in this process. And I think we had probably 30 to 40 providers in the Mr. Public School System that are doing therapeutic day treatment. And I think it's very, very unfair to choose, as we get a little talking down to six to eight providers in the school system when you don't have the principal and the CIS coordinator involved because the principals can tell you who is doing what in the school and the CIS, CIS can tell you who is doing what in the school. So you shouldn't be able to choose <coughs> provided just because of names because they've been in the system for a long time. They don't do anything. And as I spoke briefly to Ms. Willow who was heading up the program and I spoke with her along with my principal, uh, George Will, spoke and the CIS has told them about the job that youth builders do in the school system with the set success rate and with some of the um, and other things where I have to say, I don't get off, off course. But my main concern is that choosing providers that don't give what we stated off with, with our licensing department, the state was in that the parent have a right to choose who they want their child to have service under. But when you limit the possibility of them choosing who they want to have service for, I think it's unfair for the parent and the child. Because some of the providers that they may even choose, they've been in the system for a long time, some of their parents do not want their service in the long because of what type of service some of the providers have gave them. So therefore, I'm just here to state on our behalf that when our parent, when, our, when Ms. Willow talked to my principal and CIS that told them that we was the best provider in this Richmond R R RPS school at George Will, and then it's, it's a possibility that we may not be able to give service to our clients and the, the, the not only clients and the rapport that we made with the parent and the client, I think it would be unfair to the company, unfair to the parent, and to the child. That's why I'm here to represent you folks and to some other providers that maybe not at this point they know that we could come and voice our opinion. But I think the process should be more fair and open and more dialogue to who they choose to be in the public school system to do therapeutic day treatment. Because when I think also, if they, now I, I'm afraid if a people for principal or CRS and say you guys are not cutting and not doing what you're supposed to do with successful, then I can understand those providers should be out. But when you got providers in there that breaking the, the policies by which state regulations say should be one to six clients per school, but then you got some providers in there from one to ten doing what they want to do and also some of the providers that I understand that have been chosen have been in trouble, have been in trouble with D mass, have been in trouble with, with all types of things, you can bring them back into school and be unfair to people that have been doing everything by the book and success with the child, I think would be a disgrace to get them providers out of the school when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing versus 
not being chosen because you don't know my name, you fellas, but you might even know someone else because they've been in the system for a while. And that's it's some of the things that's going on. But go back, as you guys go, you can go and ask the principal of George Hope High School and the CRS coordinator that have been working the process, and they'll give you our success rate versus any other provider at George Hope High School. And I told Ms. Will, I don't need a lot of schools because the client, the employees that I put in the building, they are highly qualified. He's been teaching for 19 years plus, QMHP. The other young lady I have, she's working on her PS, PSD. She a doctor in sociology, psychology. So those people I put is qualified. They can do the job, not be put out because of our name has not been around for 15 plus years. Thanks for the time. And I advocate for a process uh, that will mean that the students will get the most effective services there, there are. However, like the gentleman ahead of us mentioned that there's a possibility that many organizations will be asked to leave and we don't know what the criteria really was. I think that's the main thing. <coughs> what criteria was used in reference to uh, taking over, I mean, uh, diminishing the total number of uh, agencies that are providing services. We work very hard. We've always worked very hard with our clients. The, we have a best practice curriculum. Uh, principals speak very highly of us. Parents speak very highly of us. We just want to make sure that we are being considered and that we're giving a fair shot at it as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would uh, like to the rest of the board tonight? Okay, so we're done. Okay. The next item is 
to install 20 salad bars, um, garden patch salad bars at RPS schools. So we are super thrilled about it and I'm here to introduce some of the members of Impact 100, um, Ms. Robinson and Ms. Rigby for the presentation. Um, so we're with Impact 100 and we're here to present this $100,000 grant to, for the Eat Fresh RPS program. Impact 100 is a program with 100 women given $1,000 to give away grants for $100,000 this year. We were able to give away two and we're excited that RPS is a recipient of one of those $100,000 grants. services um, and these are the first salad bars going in anywhere around here um, Richmond Chesterfield and Rico um, Richmond was the first to have a pilot at Fox and now um, by the end of the school year you'll have 21 and so I think that's a major testament to the RPS school nutrition services so I just wanted to applaud them tell you that this is a project that's taken two years to come to fruition. It's actually an answer to prayer because I had gotten these salad bars with, from Let's New Salad Bars to school two years ago. They donated them about $52,000 with the salad bars. But you just can't take this piece of equipment and drop it into our schools because they're old and we have lines that have to be cut out. So we're excited because some of our schools are going to not only get the garden patch, but they're going to get a brand new serving line in a couple of schools, which is really, really exciting. So I'm just honored to, that I met Mary, and Mary said, hey, do you mind if I write a proposal? I'm saying, sure, you know, keep writing. And um, Impact 100, they're just a wonderful group of, a wonderful organization. And, the night that they announced it, it was it was wonderful. I knew no matter what they said that we had won. I kept telling them. But we're so excited, and I'm just so happy the day that we open our first one uh, this school year should be sometime in October. And we'll be back to make the announcement and have pictures to show you just how that happened. Thank you. Board members, good evening. I'm happy to report to you um, some statistics tonight of all the hard efforts and the work that has taken place over the summer in order to get our staff, our, our school staff, and ready for um, opening day today. Here's some information regarding where we stand as of today. 
Um, for the 2015-16 hiring season, we approached this summer with approximately 171 total vacancies at the elementary um, level that needed to be filled. Now these, all the, the vacancies that I'm speaking of are due to resignations, retirements, <coughs> licensure non-renewals, as well as some vacancies that actually continue to come over the summer as a result of promotions that may take place. As of today, we have filled 167 elementary positions and there are only four vacant contracted positions at the elementary level that remain today. Two Title I reading positions, one kindergarten position, and one fifth grade position. At the secondary level, where um, we had more vacancies, 195 total vacancies that needed to be filled. And as of today, 169 of those uh, positions have been filled. The remaining 26 vacancies include 8.5 middle school positions, 7.5 high school positions, and then 10 other positions that are classified e either as other, such as CTE or ESL positions. And just a note here, um, two vacancies in the areas of science as well as social worker for the new Aspire Academy are the positions that are presently being recruited. We have already filled the positions for a history teacher, math teacher, English teacher, and the school counselor at the Aspire Academy. Under the MLK Reconstitution Initiative, there is one vacancy that exists. Uh, it was filled, however, the individual contacted us and they decided they needed to remain in Florida where they, where they were. So we still have one vacancy in science over there at MLK that we're trying to fill. Under the exceptional education um, category, 133 positions needed to be filled. As of today, we filled 106 of those positions. 27 other vacancies in this critical shortage, hard to staff area, include um, five elementary positions, eight middle school positions, and six positions at the high school levels. Four positions that are classified as other. Um, such as um, speech pathologists and positions of that nature, and then four positions located at our specialty um, school. So uh, here, a SPED teacher for the Aspire Academy has been hired to fill, fill that, and then under MLK Reconstitution Initiative, again, we, we had the positions all filled, and one individual decided to rescind um, the offer and change their mind. So as we stand, um, this is how we look as of today. Hello. We're happy to report that the information that I'm giving you today, these are individuals who are in contracted positions, so they are not substitutes. Um, anyone who we have not filled a position with um, as of today, they, they are and they could be a long-term sub in there. So you're looking at whatever these vacancies that still exist there's a sub in there until an individual um, comes into um, compliance or we find a licensed teacher. So that number is whatever we add up this to be here um, with a very small number. Okay. Yes. But how many long-term subs do you have throughout the district? Throughout the district would be, if I added up these, say at the elementary, you probably would have these five because someone is in the classroom. Okay. So you'd be looking at um, 26 plus, plus the four, that's 30. And then at the, um, the other 27 vacancies, so you're looking at approximately 50. Okay, so 50. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition to the 50 long term stuff that we have district wide, um, could you possibly give the board a list of all the FTEs that you all do not have the intention of filling at this time? We have vacancies, but I can't say that we have intentions of not filling them. Um, they exist, they're budgeted positions on our, on our um, reports that we have, but I have no indication that I've been given that we're not looking to fill these budgeted FTEs. So we have what our vacancy list is, but no one has said we're not we're going to work well, towards that. I was to say that is zero. We don't have any FTEs that we don't want to fill. Okay, well, the issue okay. becomes if we can't find a candidate. That's different, but we don't put an FTE in that we don't plan to fill. Okay. Our speech pathologists are very hard to find. So it becomes that becomes an issue. But we have no FTEs that we don't want to fill. Okay. Well, do you have any FTEs not necessarily that don't want to fill, but that are difficult to fill? Certainly. And are not included in that number that you present to us. Certainly, there could be some other positions in certain areas, say, of technology or higher, higher. Um, 
level types of positions that may be difficult to feel. Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Follow up with the uh, long term subs. You, the requirement for Title I is that you have to have a certified teacher in front of those children. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, did we get a waiver or something for the Title I specialist? Is there a long term sub that's currently in that position now? Yes, there's, there will be, in that one, that is not the teacher of record. So the Title I, of course, goes in for, for additional help. So they're not the teacher of record. So we're looking for that, but reading is also a critical shortage type of area in order to get someone endorsed in reading. So our search continues, but a Title I um, person is critical, but not as critical as the teacher of record um, when you're looking to, to staff a, a class. So you can Yes, they're going to be, they're going to have the appropriate endorsement um, uh, in compliance with the Virginia Department of Education. Yes, so certainly. It, it probably was okay. because again at that when you first start the beginning of the school year you are beginning the year with all of your resignations you're beginning the year with all of your retirements and it's also culminating with those individuals that we know are set to lose their certification on June 30th of that year so that's what comprises this 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 whole field right here so when we approach the end of the year around May June that's that whole list and yes that is going to be in the triple digits at that point but what I'm trying to say is when we first started our first September when I was on the school board we started the year with I think it was close to 200 vacancies and now we're down to of course, we wish it was zero, but I think there's a lot of progress has been made over the last two years, and I just wanted to commend you and your team. For that. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Also, comment that what's significant about this is we don't do the not we we hold the line now on license issues. So that's pretty Herculean. In the past, we kind of let people meander with license issue. Remember, we kind of dropped dead. We don't do that anymore. So that's even significant. This could have been larger than that. In the past, we've actually kind of been more flexible with licensure issue, giving people the time. And we've held a line on starting schools with the actual certified people and credentials, or you have to come in as a sub. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we leave and join back, Mr. Thank you, Paul. Just here to give you an update on the um, opening day for elementary. Uh, today I visited seven schools. Um, Swansboro has an interim principal, Ms. Coleman. Things were running well there. Visited uh, Miles Jones. Miles Jones breakfast in the classroom. Smooth, uh, smooth opening with that. Fisher, I met Dr. Bedden and Ms. Lawson there. Um, Mr. Walton, doing a fantastic job there with the first day and the community has welcomed them in. Went to Red, all students was in class by the time I uh, got there. It was a little bit before, uh, a little bit after nine. And Southampton talked to Ms. Cruz about the parking situation. She has now placed 
two staff members out to rectify that congestion in the morning for the parking situation. I will visit all 26 elementary schools by Friday and we'll have updates on their updates on those schools that I have visited on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So that's the um, update as far as today and how elementary went with the open. Thank Dr. Leonard, and, and we're doing this together because, you know, no accident, Dr. Leonard and I work very close with each other, and we have a smooth opening, it's because at his level or my level, it's because we've had, we've done a lot of things up to this point with our principals to make sure that everything went off smoothly. Uh, so we have the screen you see in front of you there, just a, a quick snapshot from this morning that uh, shows you current enrollment, first column over there next to the name of the schools, the, the enrollment of the school as of this morning. The next column shows you what the enrollment was projected to be uh, by our you know, projection, the projection that we do. The third column shows you the difference. If it's in red, the parentheses, that means that we're below projection. If it's in black, then that means we're above. And the fourth column over, which has 12,069 is the number you see in the column there. Uh, that is where we were in October, the October uh, end of year, or October report last fall. So kind of where were we a year ago in these schools? That's what you can look at over there. Uh, if you look all the way to the bottom right, as of today, 24 students overall, K-12, not including preschool, is what we're looking at K-12 as over last year's enrollment. Uh, if you throw, throw PK in there, certainly that does change the number quite a bit. Uh, and you can kind of see it by level. So as Dr. Leonard uh, suggested, we, you know, I was out visiting schools today. We went to about seven schools myself. Uh, we have new administrators in several of our schools, so I made sure to, to hit those schools. Um, as you know, we also worked heavily with building proper schedules with our principals. Those schedules have resulted in minimal numbers of students waiting for a schedule today. Uh, the largest number saw was at Huguenot. Huguenot had about 50 to 60 students, as students were enrolling there in large numbers. So they just walked in basically. So we have a lot of students that are still enrolling. We've had about 100 students enrolled at Huguenot in the last four days. Wow. Uh, so it's an interesting, you know, where are they coming from? How's that? How are those numbers jumping like that? So we're having to keep a close eye on that, obviously, and uh, you know, adjust our staffing as, as necessary. Uh, as Mr. Billups just uh, pointed out, we have done a great job across the division in making sure that we have good quality teachers and highly qualified teachers in front of our students. And if we do have a sub in place, it's generally a sub that we can count on and know that they're uh, maybe a retired teacher or there's someone that we know has worked with before and that they're, deli they're delivering the curriculum. Uh, we are looking for good people still. We will continue to do so until we get those filled. Uh, enrollment, those numbers you see up there are different this afternoon. They will be different tomorrow. Our principals are instructed you know, when a student doesn't show up to make them inactive so we can kind of get an idea on real bodies, how many are in the building, how many are no-shows, talk about no-shows. Uh, we will have work, be working hard to have very clean numbers because, as you know, numbers do matter. We shifted our resources in the division to try to move where the students are and meet their needs. And so um, we, started, we started looking at this about probably five weeks ago and we share it regularly, look at it closely, and uh, we want to make sure it's tight by the end of September. So that's what we look at so closely. Um, I visited Armstrong, Elkhart Thompson, Huguenot, Benford, Marshall, Henderson, and MOK today. Uh, a lot of excitement in all these schools. You know, just grab just a few minutes, do a quick flyby, uh, grab a couple of teachers, a couple of security folks, talk to the principal. How are we doing? It was a smooth open across the division uh, in secondary, as, as Dr. Lear shared with elementary. So it was a nice open today. Uh, Benford in particular, I know everyone's interested in Benford. Benford, we have 310 students there today. Uh, last year, you'll recall, October 14, we had, uh, we had 214 students there. So we have increased our enrollment considerably at Benford. We have a very energized, enthusiastic faculty and staff, uh, along with the principal and assistant principal, who are so excited about what is going on. Uh, Ms. Ricky, when I talked to her, she said, I almost got tears in my eyes seeing what some of our teachers are doing with our kids. Singing uh, to our kids, uh, doing some demonstrations, helping them just to get to know each other activities. We're incredibly engaging things that she never thought she would see, and she gets to be a part of that. So it's very exciting things that are going on at Benford. Um, 
Of course, they have their teacher laptops ran. The student uh, devices will be in next week as they work toward the one-to-one -to -one initiative. All the teachers have been fully, uh, had received full professional development and uh, the springboard and also an integrated arts. So very exciting to get a chance to stop over springboard uh, or at uh, springboard at Benford. I know school board members will probably want to step in and check that out uh, at some point. Finally, uh, Dr. Leonard and I look at our school's websites. I know you are as well. Uh, we have reached out again to our principals and said it's unacceptable to have uh, websites that are not up to date. And we have stressed that once again that we expect these websites to be up to date so that you and the community as you uh, access our school's websites, you will have good information with bell schedules, student code, student uh, <coughs> regulations and expectations. We will make sure all that is clean and consistent across our, our school. So continue to bring that to our attention. Uh, we do appreciate it, but we, we will, we're going to be making some frequent checks to get those all up to date. And I think that takes care of it. Then you have that short list that you say, where is A? He didn't show up. Uh, what's going on with him? And then the face folks get involved. And so pretty much. All this way over here. So. Yes, he, he just needed the motivation that I walked across the stage. Um, no, um, Mr. Jeffers certainly did convey the process to you. Um, we do have the administrators to mark all the students who were anticipating to show as no show. So those are students who were with us the previous year, students who didn't graduate, that we're expecting to come back in the doors of RPS. Um, that information is shared with the Office of Family and Community Engagement, as well as the social workers, and we begin to pursue those families to see if there's any obstacles, how can we connect. If they have moved and just have not done the record request and followed up to their new location, so that process does begin with you, which is why the immediate no-show is so important so we can begin working very, very quickly. Okay. Great. Another piece of that issue is if they're not physically there and they can be in another building, we're having double counts so the numbers are off and it makes it easier we try to clean up to get that final number in our total because at the end of the day you know we, we turn into the state a projection which is how we build our budget so triggering that process hopefully will give us cleaner and better data by the time we do October and where is that kid that kid is moved over to some other school and they show up in a record then they will help with the family community engagement and clean that up and say no that kid's over there and we know where they are because we've had a number of kids who moved as I walked through buildings and they were at some other school last year and that's our client tip, as you know. Uh, you know those schools that was hit hard was green. Uh, had a large, I understand, uh, influx. Registrants today, Dr. Dillon? Yes, I just finished talking to the news reporter about that. And there was 150 of those that was just showing up today for the first day. So the line was a little deceiving as far as um, what it looked like most of what it was. So I want you to understand that the reason we don't hand these out is because they're fluid all the time and that's why we don't want to give them out. So when we ran this report, by the end of the day now, that's very different than what it was. And we'll keep going through this and going through this and trying to pull it down and get the accurate numbers. And then we go through the process of where are the kids versus where are the students, I mean our teachers and where they need to be placed in the last year. Also, um, just for the record, um, the SIMS did send out a uh, announcement about the school time adjusted. I had her to send me that, I have that with me. And it went out on August 24th. And then a reminder also went out um, right after that with the, uh, through the um, internet.
you see the, uh, the projected, when you look at the projected, if there's a gross discrepancy between projected and actual, when we get to the end of September, that's where you look at staffing and say, like for instance, if we really had 150 extra kids over Huguenot, then we're gonna say how we're gonna meet the needs of those 150 students. But if you're not 30 above or 30 below, then you're generally right in the market where you have to be. So we're pretty tight. schools like it with where she is giving teachers extended duty pay to come in early. Now, I was at Marshall today. Um, they have teachers there who showed up at 7.30 in school and they have to be in classroom at 7.45. To answer the question, the policy says we have a minimum number of seven hours or until duty, pupil supervision, and all of that. So we set a minimum standard because each building is different in their needs. We could not set a concrete schedule for every school. We had to give parameters and guidelines because ultimately the issue is pupil supervision, you know, the other things that need to be done. Specifically, like some of our schools are at the cusp of losing accreditation. Whereas you got another school that's doing well. So principals have to have some latitude within a framework to do the work. We have some schools that have more stiffer accountability measures, so they're having to do more work to respond to the state requirements of information and data. So just because a teacher goes and does PD on their own, is that the right PD to be a part of the whole team? So the principal is trying to, yes, the principal is trying to get collaboration. I'm answering both of those. So each school sets and principal has the latitude. And if there's an issue, the person should go share with the principal first to start out with what is the issue. In the particular school you heard about, for example, they're there at 8 o'clock for a combination of reasons, PD and supervision. Okay, what I'm talking about is consistency because who I'm hearing from our principals who are saying to me, we can't require teachers to come in more than 15 minutes early. What I heard from you, Dr. Ben, for the email, the thread of communication you and I had going back and forth was that the same thing, you can only require teachers to come in 15 minutes early. Now, if you have a special school that's in priority or in something of that nature, of that nature, then perhaps you have an agreement where teachers come in and get professional development. But per the conversations you and I had, their contract says that they're only required to be in 15 minutes early. There's nothing in a contract that says that. Well, that's not what you communicated to um, I think, I'm not going to get into that. I think if you look at the thread and everybody received a copy, and all the principals received, that's not what it says. Okay, well, maybe we need to have a, have a conversation with the principals because I'm getting calls from principals who are saying that this is a concern and it's an issue. And I'm just trying to figure out how is this district, how are our administrators, how is this cabinet going to address the, the proper number of staffing to be able to facilitate students coming in earlier. And the way we can do that is normal. If the principal speaks to us, that's the only way we can do that. Okay. Generalizations that allow us to get to the specific school to help the problem. What the right. principal needs to tell us what their challenges are and they will help them try to solve it. We well, don't know can, where to begin. I can tell you as a parent of a student in this district that it's a concern for me, and I'm sure it's a concern for a great number of people in the community. So if this board can kind of get together and revamp how we're going to work that out, because my daughter's bus this morning was 30 minutes late, which worked out because by the time she got to school, the staffing was in place to facilitate her. But the whole purpose of moving the time pushing the time back was to allow our children more time to rest. So I'm wondering with all these numbers that you're providing to us, how are we going to facilitate those students and address the concerns of students being in an environment where they're not properly supervised because they don't have enough staff in one place. I think for me as a board member, I would continue to support the fact that our principals need the latitude to do exactly what the superintendent indicated, and that was find the funds within their building to um, request additional assistance, and it can be paid 
or offer some type of comp time for what I'm, because I'm an educator, this is what I do every single day. There is not going to be every aspect of the building that's going to be covered until all staff are in place. So I, I just I understand what you're saying and, and I support part of what you're saying, but our principles, when a principal called me about that, what I said to her was, have you had a conversation with Mr. Jeffers? Because what I don't want to get into is giving some, the email that the superintendent shared with us, after reading all of it, I was informed because I was missing some pieces. What were you informed about? I was informed of how the, what he shared with the principals, what the captain shared with the principals. I was missing bits and pieces of it because I didn't have all the thread of information. So what I would encourage us to do as a board is to continue to tell our building leaders that they need to have a conversation with their direct supervisor. And if they can't figure it out, that's all we have in place is to figure out this plan. If they can't figure out the plan, then maybe we have the wrong people in place. That's all I'm saying. Because when you're when you're talking about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, every and I can assure you, every building is different. A open is going to be different from an Armstrong or Franklin military, just based on the specialty needs of the school. So they have to work out within the staff, um, you know, who's going to be in the bus room at this time, who's going to be in front of the bathroom at this time, who's going to be in the cafeteria at this time. That has to be worked out within a leadership team within the building. And then it is not worked out within the leadership team of the building. Then I think we need to be informed, as, as the principals have, have done with you. But I think, first of all, our principals need to read the information that is given to them. Because if the superintendent sent the information, same information to us that he sent to the people who lead the schools, then I'm concerned about why we're receiving calls. Because after I read the information, I was like, oh, okay, I'm good. So they have to read the information thoroughly. And then I think we'll be in a better position. Um, I don't really have a question. I have more of a request that uh, with our attendance numbers, it would be too much to ask that we have a renewed commitment to receiving that information, perhaps in the weekly report or at least once a month. We, we can, I think last year, Mrs. Epps, we, we sent it weekly at a certain point. We, we start doing that until we get to the official count. Okay. Uh, I just, I would tell you that it changes so dramatically during this first week. The earliest it will start to be the next week when it starts to sell in because you, you'll see large swings, but then we can start back running this and, and send it out in a weekly report until we turn it into official count. Right. Just Thank an you. example, I think on Friday, we were, in that, we're at 24 in the positive is, I think we were 210 in the hole on Friday. So, I mean, it really splashed Level out. I think remind what Ralph when we turn in the new flat for the budget to the state. Yeah. Did we? Was it 100 or was it flat more? What do we project? The overall. We increased by another 90. 90. So that's the magical number to, to yeah. keep us hold that we hope they hit 90 or better. Okay. Nine students. About 24 yeah, 90 more students. Oh, okay. <laughs> we turn in for funding from the state. So we want that 24 to keep going. Any final problems? Okay, I was just going to add to that that I think we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge that if a problem should arise, and just based on history, that mm -hmm. is the practice, then we want to make sure that we have enough people in place to attend to an emergency. Of course, we can't be in every place to oversee every student individually. But we don't want to be put in a position where we'll be liable because we don't have this, the proper ratio of teacher to students. And also, I think that this issue needs to come back before the board as a whole because I think one sort of it, you brought it to the attention of the board that you wanted to put forth and push the time back to allow students to receive more rest. And that's not happening with this new, uh, with this transportation concern. So if we could find a way to have uh, some form of presentation in the near future, perhaps at least by the first meeting in October, to see how we're going to address that concern because that's what we presented to the public when we pushed for the time to move back to because statistics show that <coughs> students need more rest. And that's not happening with this case because even my child, her time just moved back earlier than it was last year, which leaves more time for her to be in the building. 
And again, it is a concern for many of our principals. So if we can agree to bring that back before the board to see how it's working out in the near future. We I absolutely will we'll do that, Ms. Taylor. If you remember, the conversation was that and Mr. Uh, started the actual comment was, can we actually consider this a trans transition trial year, if you remember, because we could not get the time that we really wanted. We backed off the original time that we proposed because of the issue with elementary, that we had child care issues and concerns with elementary uh, parents saying that, what am I going to do for child care if we flip them? The other thing that we identified was that we have too many fields in places where there's not lights. So then daylight saving time became an issue for our sporting events. So the compromise was to just do the 8 o'clock to start. I also think that what you would hear from transportation is that they will keep continuing to modify as they run the routes. And then that is the probably good time that they will be able to come in and say, here's the final where we are with pickup times. That will then be the true, I think, baseline for us to talk about how well we did in getting where we are and uh, trying to get that back. The optimal time by the American Pediatrics Association was that middle school and high school kids should not start before 8.30. But we could not put all our middle school and high school at 8.30 because of bus transportation limitations. And so then we had talked about flipping the elementary and high school. And the issue was we could not get a true number of quality of after care programs. While we have a number of schools that have them, we have grave concern of the quality of the programs consistently. So we backed off this year and made the soft movement this year to this compromise time. And when we made the presentation, I actually said to the board, this is a compromise to move us in the right direction <coughs> until we can finally get this figured out. Whether we're going to get more drivers or buses, which also is a challenge, even getting drivers. Uh, but we absolutely will be coming back uh, as they settle in to see the final numbers on transportation, what the true pickup times are. I would encourage the parents that there will be another up refresh on Friday of the times, because if you listen to a bus driver, many of them had stops that didn't have anybody there. So one of the things that happens is you start collapsing routes, which then frees up bus drivers to probably do more. So we will be bringing it back to the board as we see where the kids are, what the challenges are going to be. We're also having this curveball thrown at us with uh, that big thing that's happening this month. Let's start a little wrench <coughs> trying to get times down and other things that we're playing with. So we will be bringing it back to you. Good evening. I'll report on professional development. So you know we had three solid days of district-wide professional development in addition to the days that teachers and administrators had either in their school buildings or, or outside of their school buildings. So we had about 2,000 teachers, that's roughly, who attended professional development that uh, centered around the new curriculum um, guides and the pacing guides and all of the instructional materials, which were, uh, by the way, written, um, led by our curriculum instruction and Title I specialists, but written by teachers, for teachers, always the best way to go. So we were able to address multiple uh, perspectives from each of the curricula written in the core content areas. We were able to do professional development um, centered around differentiated instruction. We had Aspen professional development, uh, a couple of uh, primary grades, make it, take it sessions, art, Google Docs, um, customer service training. Uh, we also had professional development centered on exceptional education. Early childhood had two days of professional development last week. And then we had our institutes. So we had, of course, you know, the Leadership Institute um, early on in August, which was followed up by the Title I Institute, and then followed by the C Career Technology Education Institute. We also had New Teacher Institute in there, and then on one day, I believe it was August the 19th, we collaborated, or we sort of combined the Title I and the New Teacher Institute which was a partnership with RPS and MSR 2020, fabulously attended. We had some wonderful guest speakers on those days, which really, really motivated both our teachers and our administrators. So we had great professional development over the course of the month leading up to today. Um, we also have, we're still tabulating 
the evaluations that are centered on the Title I um, Institute and the CTE Institute, as well as, as well as all of the professional development that happened those three days for teachers. Um, so we're still tabulating that, but I do have some figures for the Leadership Institute, which we tabulated. And it was overwhelmingly positive. For example, we asked um, administrators and all those who attended with, about the overall quality of the professional development. We asked them about the ability to improve their instructional leadership. And I can tell you, at both levels, secondary as well as elementary, our administrators said 100%. 92% were uh, rated that professional development as very effective or very satisfied. 8% were satisfied at the elementary level. 80% were uh, rated it as a very effective or very satisfied with the professional development at the secondary level, with 20% um, as um, effective. So overwhelmingly, 100% of the attendees appreciated the professional development, said that they needed more of that uh, professional development, and we are here to provide that for them. So that will continue. Part of the leadership professional development in which the administrators particularly like, of course, had to do with Dr. Bedden's talk about systems thinking. Uh, we had one day of wellness, so we helped administrators understand how to take care of themselves and, and how to reduce some of their stress levels and, and get moving and have fun with it, with their staffs as well. But the other part was um, pretty serious and very, very well um, received, and that had to do with instructional leadership. So leading effective instruction is what we call that, LEI for short. We started last spring. We had a few days over the summer at the Leadership Institute, and then we'll continue throughout the school year. So it is in part face-to-face, uh, -face, sort of classroom-style professional development, and then boots on the ground. So they will be working, administrators will be working in small cohorts, going to visit schools, and they'll be in classrooms, and they will be doing their observations of professional development in collaborative groups out at the schools. So that is just very well received, and they want to continue with that type of professional development. Again, we also did customer service training, uh, which was a collaboration from lots of different areas. We did um, sessions with the face office, and that was very, very well received. We had uh, math and science, of course, more systems thinking, that wellness piece of it, that was very well received. And what we learned um, that we will continue to do or move toward, I'll say that, is one, we had to make some adjustments in terms of technology. So we had to work out a couple of kinks because we really want to focus on being more green so that we don't have um, uh, reams and reams of paper being produced and copied and what have you. So we had to do some work on ensuring that all of our teachers had access to Google Docs um, and are trained in Google Docs so that work continues. The other thing that we want to make sure that we do, and, and this comes from having spoken to lots of the teachers that were involved with the professional development, is we want to make sure that we are um, giving them, and they appreciate it this year, lots of hands-on. So I had some primary teachers who really want to do a lot more make it, take it sessions. Um, we also talked about having one session of professional development followed by another session where they could put into practice what they learned and possibly start doing some planning so that we could uh, reduce some of the paperwork that they had to do back at the school. But since they were there in groups, they could work collaboratively in groups. So we'll continue with that. We'll have more professional development for instructional assistants. And we will also have uh, more professional development in collaboration with some of our partners so that everybody is on the same page. Um, so that pretty much is a, um, a brief summary on the professional development that we had. Again, very, very well received. And as soon as we have numbers and, and the summary reports for the teacher professional development that went on, we will make sure that you get those. But I am happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Uh, Ms. Haynes, I noticed you did a description of the entire work just to train for parents. And I know that last year you were really kind of pushed to make sure that during the school year, parents were doing those various trainings. Are we going to continue with that pattern this year? 
absolutely. And we did have some sessions where some parents were there, but we will continue that. And that's part of our parent university. So part of the academic improvement plan, we talked about having some parent professional development, parent involvement um, conferences that we would move to different locations throughout the city. So absolutely throughout the year, we will have that. Ms. Kay, um, what method are we using to track those teachers who did not attend professional development days, particularly in their building when they went back to their building? As you know, that has always been a concern of mine um, because they are not attended as, as they should. So what methods, again, what methods do we have in place that will track um, those who are attending, and then the second part to that is, what are we doing about it? Great question. So what we hope to have done is to have, have all of the registration electronic for the summer, but we weren't quite there yet. Uh, moving forward, and we hope to have our November professional development ready for online registration. So right now, for the summer, we did do paper pencil. Um, but moving forward, and that's part of the academic improvement plan also surrounding professional development, is to uh, have all of that registration electronic. So it will keep track of all of their uh, continuing education points, their certifications, they can do their evaluations online. And for teachers who need this, principals can help to sort of uh, identify professional development that would address some of the deficiencies that teachers may need to brush up. So it can be targeted and multifaceted. So some of the professional development certainly would be face-to-face, -face. some of it would be online professional development. So there are a variety of, of ways that we can address that. Sarah, one of the conversations we had at IT, we don't know if we have the ability yet, was to reissue all of our staff IDs and barcodes to move to a swipe system, electronic coding check-in. Again, early conversations, but we're trying to move everything from paper to pencil. Actually, barcoding capabilities to swipe in and attend a session and stuff. Uh, the other thing that I heard when I walked around visiting was there's you know, certain sessions that were very popular. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you're able to do is if you get a pre registration online, mm -hmm. you look at the tallies mm -hmm. where there's not a lot of attendance, mm -hmm. you can drop that session mm -hmm. and then add another one mm -hmm. to respond to the needs. So if we can get that up and running. It's ambitious November, but she wants to try it but that's our, <laughs> our goal is to get to a system where it really is like our internal version of going to a conference. My concern, thank you so much. I appreciate that follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, re the reason why I'm stressing that and our RD representatives are here is because I, I spoke with a couple of teachers who, who called me and said that um, one of them stated, I don't know what to do, it's not clear, I didn't get the information to the first thing this morning, so I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to my building. And what I said to those individuals or that person that stated that to me was, you know, attending your, your assigned professional development is a part of your teacher evaluation system, period. So if you're not attending based on lack of information or the person you called or whatever, whatever the information was that this individual gave me, I said, we have lines of communication where you can find out the information. So I am stating, as a board member, out loud so everybody can hear it, I'm going to make sure we hold them accountable. Because when, when we go through all of this to make sure that the professional development is intense, it is um, effective, it is um, mirrored to their content area and to their pedagogy, and then you find an excuse because the email was late or the Google document couldn't be open or what have you, as many times as our teachers text and, and get on social media and all of that stuff, we have to eliminate as much as possible the excuses that they may have not to attend professional development, which provides growth in their field. So I'm very passionate about that. Um, so I appreciate everything that you all are doing to make sure that they attend and that the sessions that they do attend are um, good sessions, are, are great sessions. So. You know, I just, we need to make sure that it's communicated throughout the building. Then the last piece of that is our principal, our building administrators need to do a better job, I think, in communicating where their people need to be. 
period. They need to do a better, because if they communicate that, then, and I know that the communication was sent to them because we as the board received the communication. So if they communicate it, then that will eliminate some of I don't know and then the stuff that comes after that. So I am asking you all to hold them accountable for, for the information that needs to be shared. Thank you. Absolutely, and so I'll bear part of that uh, because of the disconnect. Some of our teachers did not have email accounts yet. Um, and some of our teachers, we did not realize, did not have access to Google Docs. And some of that was because their computers at home or at school did not have the app, the Google Doc app. So there were a variety of reasons, which is why at the last minute you saw those emails from me that everybody got. So I wanted to ensure that everybody knew each morning what professional development was being offered. So regardless, and then I started to send attachments in addition to access to the Google Docs. And I appreciate um, that. So that, yeah, so regardless of what your technology is, um, that you could have it. So that's why you got some of those uh, calls about I didn't get it until this morning because a couple of other um, right. ways they didn't yeah. get. So we're tightening up on all of those things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Good afternoon, school board, school board chair and vice chair, school board members. As you know, uh, we have embarked on a comprehensive process to review all third party providers within the district and to really analyze and evaluate the services that they provided to our students and in our buildings and to re uh, really measure the outcomes. Um, as a part of the process, we reviewed 117 applications, 29 of which were uh, therapeutic day treatment providers and we came out with a comprehensive process in evaluating and ranking those providers and providing you with a recommendation of who should continue service within Richmond Public Schools and why. Um, at this point, do you have any questions, additional questions that we can answer for you regarding that process? I don't have any questions. I, I just really um, want to applaud you all for creating this process because when, when I first arrived on the board in 2013, and this is going to be hard for people to believe, but it was 52 providers in MLK. And none of those providers talked to each other. None of those providers had a common goal as to how children were going to receive those wraparound services that each of them said they were going to provide for those kids. So first of all, you're, you're in a middle school that's in a transition with the building. I'm just using MLK because that's the school that I spent a lot of time in, knew that there were some issues or what have you, whatever. But when you have 52 providers in a building and they're receiving some level of funding from either the city, state, or the school system, and you don't have communication, you, it, it could have been 15 providers servicing Shonda Harris Muhammad. And Shonda Harris Muhammad is still failing. Shonda Harris Muhammad is still having discipline issues. I'm just using myself as an example, not that any of those things are true. But I'm just saying that, <laughs> that I'm just saying I didn't expect a laugh, but I'm just saying that that's a concern. So when when I have providers call me, because one I'm an educator, and I think some of them assume that I'm gonna fight for everyone that calls, but I need for people to understand that when you get in front of children and you provide them a service, whatever that service is, this thing is real. So you just can't come in and say, because I've been working with this child for, I don't know, 15, 16 months, but I look at has the child moved with whatever you were servicing the child with. So we have to look at what's in the best interest of children. Now it was always in the best interest of the school. And if it's not working for that child, whatever the service provider is, I don't have my best. I don't, I don't, you know, have the worst. All I'm saying is, if we didn't have this process in place, we would still be having service providers, whoever they are, in front of our children, and our children are not moving. Period. 
Right. So I applaud the change. I'm glad it has been put in place. And if I, I'm just saying for me, 30 seconds. I can't have 50 supervisors in the, in the building and, and wraparound services are not being provided to children. So something needed to be done. And well, I'm glad it was done. Well, thank you. The overall process was to really re um, review the quality of the services provided. I think the quantity or, or the reduction of quantity of providers is a mere byproduct of the initiative. So we weren't looking to go in there and chop providers. We were looking to really assess and evaluate the services provided, understand that what they say they're providing is actually what the children are receiving, and actually that the pendulum is moving in the right direction. So that's, that's the purpose. Um, one other thing is that the district is um, all of the providers that are not going to be recommended to move forward um, with services in the district, um, especially with the TDT providers, the state actually requires a 30-day transition period, so 30, 35 days. We're actually giving a, a, a transition period that's up to, uh, I think, 100 days. So any providers that are not recommended to return the 2015-2016 school year will be given a phase-out date, and they have to exit RPS um, by December 18th. So all students and parents who might be impacted by this, um, by these recommendations will be notified tomorrow and then the transition period begins. Um, to help to service our families, we'll be having three information sessions um, across the district. Um, if there aren't any um, questions that bars that this evening, we will we'll be posting those notices tomorrow. Well, the, the criteria was all in the application, so each provider that filled out the application, it was very comprehensive. They had to list their outcomes. Um, everything that was they're evaluated on was asked in the application. Some of them had questions and called, and those um, uh, clarification was provided to them, so yes. And if I, if I didn't get in this year, does that <coughs> preclude me from ever coming back? Or no, ma'am. If you didn't get in this year, um, you can apply next year. It does the the process doesn't bar you from ever entering RPS again. You you just have to at your time of application uh, meet all of the criteria. So the applications are found where? The applications were on the partnership agreement, um, the partnership office of community partnerships website, and they were provided to each partner. Um, each existing partner and anyone that wanted to do business with RPS who weren't existing partners. So if I became a provider tomorrow, I could go to the RPS website and... Well, you wouldn't become a partner tomorrow, you would have to apply. Now, if I became a provider tomorrow and I was interested in applying... At oh, absolutely. So that going, criteria is somewhere yes. that I can find yes. it on our yes. website. It is, absolutely. Listed right now, current. Okay. Um, is there some way that we could share this information, like the detailed information that you shared with us in the weekly report um, with our colleagues on city council? Because I feel like as we move forward in this process, that they might get some calls and have some questions. And I've gotten questions from city council members before about, you know, outside providers in our school and what the vetting process is and everything. But I know sometimes when people, uh, you know, are yes. go through that process, well, yes. they want to well, contact the, the what elected What we prepared, Ms. Um, Larson. Absolutely. We, we are dying because I haven't stopped the presses because of public communications and we out one last day in person to talk to this person. Uh, we will also send all of those communications that you all got down to her tomorrow. Okay. And then offer if she wants someone to walk her through this process so that she feels any initial questions and then we'll make ourselves available if the council person wants to talk to you. Right. Can we also post those FAQs on our website? Yes. Yes. Um, so 
Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> On the next slide, you'll see um, this is a small group area. This was 201A, so that's part of that back room. This is where we'll have some small group instruction if needed, some remediation. This would also be a place where uh, groups can be provided from some of our community partners that will be supporting us and supporting students. This is our hallway of Aspire Academy. Again, that's also in that whole 201 uh, location. Very quickly, just for your review and update, as I shared earlier this week, we will be having families and students to come in to have an orientation period where uh, we will acclimate those persons to the program, particularly uh, those persons who were unable to make our family nights on last week to explain the program, and also to look at the student's transcript to identify what coursework is needed and to plot out a plan for graduation. Those um, orientation peers will be scheduled in small groups so that we can have a more close conversation about what the students needs are. And there'll also be a presentation by uh, our partner who will provide some additional services for us. Um, during this week, students will also be working on an independent project where we'll have some goal setting for their career and academic plans. And any students who need IEP meetings, that's taking place this week as well. On the next slide, you'll see that we will begin our actual classes on Monday. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. And our students have expressed excitement as well. And as I take my seat, um, today we ran into one of our students who is slated to attend the Spire Academy, but there was some change in address, so some paperwork went to different places. Uh, nonetheless, this person, this student showed up at Armstrong, and so I talked with her about the program, and as this young lady stood in front of me, she called her mom, she explained the program to her mom. She said, Mom, this is going to be a great program, it's going to help me graduate on time. Um, so I was encouraged, and she was encouraged as a student, and was able to articulate that to her family. So I would encourage you, if you have an opportunity, please do come and see the great things that are going to be happening at Aspire Academy. And if there are no questions... Board member, thank you. Our boy is underrepresenting the excitement. Parents <laughs> have tears in their eyes at Armstrong wanting to get their kids in this program. And that the district was even investing resources to try to do this program for kids who are over age, undercredited, or not being successful. I mean, crying with excitement about getting in this program. We, I, I get emails now begging to get their children in. So we're looking forward to it. Principal, you know, you all approved uh, last week, uh, so we're looking forward to it. She's in Baller Energy, uh, up and running. Um, we're excited. Our partners in the community are excited, and they've heard about this. For a lot of our students, it may be their last chance. So, great. Um, just max capacity and enrollment. Yes, ma'am. So we were targeting approximately 60 students. Um, for some of the reasons that Dr. Bedden said, we were at 65, um, because in some situations we just couldn't say no. Um, but we do have a current waiting list because we want to make sure that we maintain the integrity and the setup of the program with the being small group and having an A and B session. Um, at the end of next week, if we do have any um, students who have moved, who, who don't show, then we will begin to work off our wait list and we've communicated that information uh, to families. So if you have any questions that, that come your way, we understand that it's a new program, please do encourage them to uh, to call us and we'll be happy to, to walk them through the process. Can you give us a list of the students that have So the number of students going to each high school is going to be able to report. That is correct. Mr. Bourne, how are you doing, sir? I'm good. Um, so from an operation standpoint, we had a successful opening of school. Huh? You're special. No. So we had a successful opening this year's school. On the facility side, we had some huge changes, obviously, with the portables or the modular building sitting at Green and Broad Rock. 
Um, those went in successfully. Um, the students moved in. And I'd like to take this time to thank three individuals that worked uh, an un, a large amount of hours uh, with me, uh, being Damone Harris and my two Stanton brothers. Um, their time that they spent, would not, we would not have accomplished moving those buildings in place uh, without their efforts and some other key members of the team. And um, it was a Herculean effort to get that done. Um, but it all got done in place. We are continuing to move and work with each school. Uh, we have some schools that we already know are needs of additional classrooms. Um, and we'll look at the actual enrollment and then work with those schools. And we may have additional modular buildings going in place to meet the needs of our schools and ensure that they have the facility resources to be successful. We are working diligently to get rid of all of the least portables that have been in this district, some of which since 1991. Um, we are, those, those portables that have been with us since 1991, we've actually paid out over $118,000 since the beginning of time on those portables. A brand new module, a brand new module today with everything state of the art would cost no more than $80,000. So we're working diligently to get rid of those, but it's not that simple to just pick them up and move them. I have to make sure the schools have the facilities and the space, and you may see some additional modulars taking place. School nutrition, we've started off again this year with the CEP program. So every child will eat breakfast and lunch free. We've expanded the breakfast in the classroom program to all of our schools. It's worked very well today. Um, yes, we're gonna have some hiccups and some bumps, but overall, it's been very successful. As you heard, the program this year is improving the nutrition and the offerings for our students. It's not just improving the nutrition, but getting our students to actually eat with us. Okay, it's not enough just to offer it. If you don't have the children eating it, I mean, it's fine to take it, but when they throw it in the garbage can, it doesn't count. And when they don't take it, it doesn't count, okay? So it's about getting children to eat. And that's one thing that Impact 100 grant will do, is it starts to allow us to do some different ways of offering the product, because school nutrition is competing with the McDonald's, the convenience stores, the grocery stores, anybody that sells food. That's who our direct competition is, but they don't have to comply with all the USDA rules and regulations we have to comply with. So that grant will allow us to do some things. We also introduced hydration stations at 26 of our elementary schools. Um, we hope working with the city health department we can expand that offering both in our middle schools and our high schools. Transportation, well, that's the big discussion tonight. Um, understand when we did the routes, Richmond had a lot of inefficiencies in the prior years. Things were done that you wouldn't normally do from a transportation standpoint. If a school started at 725, but you knew and you planned the bus to get there at 6, 705, and some as early last year at 650, but it's getting there at 725 day in and day out, then obviously your route wasn't done correctly. And all of our buses run three tiers. Every bus runs three tiers. So if I'm late on tier one, and I'm getting there like last year at 725, and my first stop on tier two is at 705, it physically not gonna ever happen. And then when I'm late on the middle school, I'm then late to the elementary school. And who suffered? The students. But the student that suffered the most was our elementary school students because they sit on the third tier. And when buses are late every day, and a bus at an elementary school, on average, let's just use 50 students, some go as high as 70. That's 50 students across the board that got to school 30 minutes late. Every single day. Think of the time their educational opportunities were impacted. That's been happening for years. It didn't happen last year for the first time. It's been going on for years and years and years. 
So from a transportation standpoint, when the new bell schedule was introduced, did it impact us adjustment? A little bit, we'll talk about that. But the biggest thing for us in developing the routes was to have true routes. Be able to bring students to school on time. Be able to bring students home on time. Not post times that was made in the sky. Let's post times that we're actually going to bring the students to their respective school. Now what happened this school year compared to last year? And there's three things, there's three events that took place that we need to consider. Number one, Thompson last year was in tier one. That was 17 buses that ran on tier one that then were available to go pick up on tier two. This year, we combined Elkhart and Thompson and kept it on tier two because we wanted all our middle, middle schools to be on the same tier time. Makes sense. Right now, today, I've got 24 buses that are picking up. And remember, Thompson sits here, the students are way over here and down here. They're going the greatest distance south of the river. So the buses, if I'm going to be picking those students up and getting them to Elkhart Thompson on time, I have to free assets up to go pick them up. The second thing we did, we moved six elementary schools from the second tier to the third tier. So all 25 elementary schools were on the same exact time. That's 24, approximately 24 buses that ran last year in second tier, now we're on the third tier. Now, the thing that hurts this district transportation-wise is this. When we have a Huguenot and Thompson that are here, but in Huguenot case, their student base is where? Down here. When we have an Elkhart Thompson and their school's here, but their students are here and here, those assets that have to pick up those students bring them to their school, and then get back to their designated spot to run their second tier, that's where you start running late every day. Today we had an accident on Chippenham Parkway. I had a number of buses stopped for 45 minutes because of that situation. But we have accidents every day. I had my first accident with a bus today. Not our fault. Knock on wood. But things are going to happen. And so when we build the schedule, if I build it to be perfect every day, it's not going to happen. And so then what happens? I'm late every single day. And who's penalized? Students. Students. So when we built this, we built it so that we would have reality. But the third thing that comes into play, and I mentioned this at the last board meeting, for three special schools, Jefferson, Community, and Franklin Military. We run 35 buses there because we go district-wide. We go city-wide. If we eliminated neighborhood stops, which it's my understanding, looking at the history, we were supposed to be hub stops from the beginning. But we're not hub stops today. Because we did that, the cost to the district today is we spend $175,000 more in transportation <coughs> costs because I could eliminate, just by going to Hubs, being the elementary school, 12 buses. Now, it's not just those schools. Today, we got requests to change bus, bus locations, bus stops. I have over 200 requests came in just today we have people who want us to be at their doors. Now, transportation historically runs two to three million dollars over budget. In the past, the actual revenues exceeded the expenses to cover that. That's great. Going forward, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. So now, when you look at the statute, it says, you can only spend what you receive. If we try to go above that, there's consequences to that that have to be done. So 
what our directive is, is get our budget of transportation in line so that we're not taking, because when we exceed the budget, that means we're taking those resources and Ralph and Dr. Benton have to do the allocation. But in a simplistic world, we're taking resources out of classroom. So everything that we do is for us to ensure the students have the best opportunity to be successful. And if I can't get the budget, who gets hurt? Students. So that's how we developed our transportation routes. As Dr. Benton said, we were early to that, but we wanted to be early. It's easier for me to adjust backwards than to adjust forward. We'll see over the next couple of days what were the actual stops. For example, at Huguenot, I had the first bus show up today at Huguenot at about 7 o'clock. But out of their stops, they had one stop that had 28 students, and not one was on the bus. Okay? Now, do I eliminate that stop? We'll think about it. If it goes two more days, yes, that stop will get eliminated. We don't know exactly every student that's going to ride a bus on the first day. So we have to do some projections. And this first two weeks for us is to tweak those projections for what the actual numbers will be. Our goal is to get our school students to their high schools between 7.30 to 7.45. Last year, our goal was to get to our high schools at 7.05, which meant we were there 20 minutes before the first bell. But if we don't make 7.05, we're late to the middle, and then we're late to the high. If we don't make that 7.15 and 7.30, we're late to the middle, and we're, I mean, late to the middle in elementary is what I meant. So that's the nuances we have to work with. We don't want our children to be earlier than what we had to. Believe me, the time, the, the countless hours and days that were spent trying to tweak our routes. And I'd like to commend Floyd and his team because they've worked extremely hard, extremely diligently, and they need to take a lot of credit because this year it, it hasn't been perfect, but it's never going to be perfect. But they've done an outstanding job, and with that, I'm finished talking. <laughs> Instead of being 15 minutes early, there were maybe you know 30 to 35 minutes on the best case. So we had some get there as late as 7, you know, 45. The one that we're struggling with are those that are citywide, and I think those will have the biggest adjustment, to be honest, because we can look at the the zone 
and through their enrollment projections, you know, kind of be fairly close. We may lose a stop here, but we'll gain a stop there. The citywide, I think we were ultra conservative in the way we did the routing this year. And I think you'll see a significant change where, like in the case of your daughter and other folks that I've talked to, instead of a baby being a 715, we bring it into that 730 to 740-ish you know, time frame that we're trying to get to. But we were ultra conservative. We, we wanted to make sure, because too much last year, we said we'll be able to stop at 7 o'clock, and we didn't get there to 730 the whole year. You know, and I'm using that as an example. But it happened on our elementary schools a lot. We're trying to get away from that. But you're exactly right. It's a very fair question. I think as a board, we need to um, look at or continue to operate on what is best for children. I'm not sure if going door to door or every other door to pick up children is in the best interest, not only for the entire district, for students in the district, but also for our budget. Um, I think we need to, if, if we do not have hubs in place, we need to bring hubs back. Um, and I think we need to look at, um, you stated earlier, 35 buses between three schools. This, you named Thomas Jefferson and a couple of other schools at a cost of $175,000 or more in transportation. We're going to have to start having these courageous conversations with parents who call us four or five times a day about, well, I want my child, I can't get my child to Lucy Brown Middle School and I live in Highland Park. Okay, we're going to have to offer a hub type situation and not banging down your door or the superintendent's door about, okay, well, we're going to bring a bus to 3rd Avenue. That may not be in the best interest of all students who are being transported to other schools. And I understand that we, as mass people that, that form this board, collectively serve districts. Mm -hmm. But we also holistically serve a school district. And we need to function in that manner. We need to speak in that manner and we need to operate in that manner. And then when we stand on that, what's best for children in the district, and that because um, a child that lives on Third Avenue wanted to get to Lucille Brown Middle School, we're gonna have to offer, we're not saying that we're not gonna get your child to that school, but what we're saying is, we're not gonna be able to bring a bus to the corner of Third and Wickham. So we're gonna have to come up with some solutions, and that's real talk. Mm -hmm. and, and you become a servant leader when you have courageous conversations mm -hmm. that's in the best interest of all children and not for a particular group of children. Mm -hmm. Because you don't move a school district that way. So we're going to have to stand on what is best for children in the district and not a collective group of children. We can work that thing out. But in, in, until we stop doing that, these little pieces over here, you know, we're going to continue to have this conversation. Yes, ma'am, and I'll, and I'll leave one number with you. Of our 24,000 students that go to our schools daily, approximately 20,000 ride a bus, okay? And what we're trying to do this year in transportation is be fair and be consistent how we treat all 20,000 students and not differentiate it between one and the other. And that's tough. Everybody's got a unique story. And everybody has unique circumstances. But I believe that in the public school system, you have to be consistent, fair, and, and all children have the same opportunity. All right, thank you. Ms. Francis, ready to do the uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'm ready to go with the bikes. <laughs> I just have one quick comment because, you know, we serve 24,000 students, but every student matters. When I went to pick my children up at Holton today, the, um, I witnessed the bus driver walking a student out to the bus, and she said, you see, I told you I was going to take care of you and get you on the bus today. And that's, that's what makes all the difference. And that's something that she didn't know I could hear her. This little boy was obviously a kindergartner, scared out of his mind when he got on that bus this morning. And that's what makes all the difference. And, and that's something that I think we need to do more of. And I, I think it was very impressive. I got the bus number. I didn't get her name or anything because I didn't want her to know I was being nosy. But, um, really? Yeah. <laughs> but 
that's what makes the difference is when we treat every one of our 24,000. Right. Can you do the bike race from here the chest more Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> the bike race. Um, and I'm going to read you by day these times. Okay? Just, just, you don't need to write it. It's out there on their website so you understand the situation. On Monday, the race starts at 10 a.m. It ends at 3.50. They'll close the streets beginning at 9 a.m. So on Monday, we should be able to get all our students first, second, and third tier to school. At 3.50, our elementary school is dismissed at 3.45. So you see the challenge. On Tuesday, and remember, all our buses serve all our schools. On Tuesday, and Monday and Tuesday's route race course is the exact same. Starts at 9.30 in the morning, so that means they'll close the streets at 8.30. That means we can get first and second tier, but guess who gets impacted? Third tier. It ends, instead of 3.50, at 4.45. And they're not projecting roads to be open until an hour after the course race ends. On, on the men's elite, which runs on Wednesday, this is the run that runs north and south and has had the other counties canceling their schools. It will start at 1 p.m. and end at 3.35. So our second, first and second are both impacted in the morning. I mean in the afternoon. Now remember, all the times I just said, who's also impacted? Midday runs. So our ability to get to tech center, our ability to do field trips, anything that's done in the middle of the day is significantly impacted by the race. On Thursday, which is the longest race course for us, going west to east, this goes down into the Shockey Bottom, Bellevue. Uh, is that Shocky Bottom, Shaco. I look. It's been a long. It's been a long weekend. Okay, so I apologize. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's that South Louisiana. Okay. So on Thursday, now again, the longest course. This will impact the greatest number of schools. It starts at 10 a.m. and will go to approximately 2 p.m. Okay. Uh, but it's the longest course and nobody really knows how it's going to be impacted and also what happens beginning Thursday the greatest number of visitors start coming with it growing significantly on Friday Friday is the premier race they've sold the most sponsorships for Friday Friday starts at 10 a.m. so that means 9 and it ends at 450 now Schools at every school in our system is going to be impacted that's north of the river. Okay? But the schools that are directly impacted, meaning that the course actually splits their zone. Now remember, we have 50 schools counting on pre K. Of that, we have 17 that actually touch a race course. That's 34% of our schools. And the biggest number are impacted on Thursday and Friday. Friday should be the highest number of, rate of, of visitors to our community. The recommendation that this administration thinks is in the best interest of both our students, our staff, and all of our citizens that are members of the RPS community is to close schools and all offices on Friday, the 25th, and a two-hour early dismissal on Thursday, the 24th. And that would apply to all personnel. And we would need your permission tonight to go take action on that. The new information we got, we discussed it with the chair and vice chair, it's just getting too hairy and messy. Um, and then even like today, getting here, with all the work being done, and we want everyone off because we're going to have a significant problem with parents, uh, teachers, their children, they're living in the suburbs. So, that's why we just need to shut down all together on Friday also. Uh, not have the work being just totally shut down. Just to be fair to those who because they may be impacted by other agencies that are closing, they can't get child care, can't get all that other stuff. So we just think we just need to shut down all together on Friday.
So a couple hours earlier on Thursday. So we think the other days is gonna be better? We just can't afford to lose this we think it was gonna be worse. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're gonna be a little bit better, but then you're gonna be a problem. But we give us eleven days last year with snow, but we can't put all okay. those. That's the, so we try to address the most egregious time of the week. So I'm a parent of the most precious child in this world that attends RPN. So I tell my child to stay home that whole week because of this mask, which is, which is a good mask, but it's still a mask. So y'all be kind of absent. Monday, Susan Wilson. Why? Because they're asking you. I'm still marketing. I mean, what, what I'm saying is, I think we need to. I think we we need to um, be excused. I mean, I understand how Biden is not in the building. Maybe let me rephrase the question: Is it going to be an excused absence? And I think it should be for parents who um, take their children. Well, any child, not just for parents who take their child, children to school and pick them up, but. It's, it's, I'm not convinced to get to my child. My child is not the baby to get home until possibly 6, 6 and, and I would say to you that we're, that's a conversation we need to have with the state because no one else is closing any days in the public school system. And, and I think they need to. Okay, well, we're off the closing. Okay, I, I look more to go ahead. And just to, to, to blanketly do an excuse, I think I want to have a conversation with the state superintendent how that looks for us because here's my concern too. If we put that out and they know we're doing that, we're gonna have just masks, just no one. Oh, kind of school? Yeah. So uh, I would just tell you that I, I like it if, if the board wants that as a consideration, I think I need to make a phone call in advance and talk it through with BDO. How, how do we, how do we as students which we call schools, Balance these competing interests by being a big part of the city of an international event. But also, so there's that uh, in the first order. Um, and, and then, you know, making sure we get our kids to and from safely and efficiently. But more importantly, balancing the, the, the academic time. Well, um, and, and, and so maybe it's not closing, it's more options looked at about. Altering the, the, the times of you know, half days that be. I, I don't know what the answer is. Well, I, I think that we we and, will and, and, and I say that because I think one of the things we ought to say to the state is, unlike our neighboring jurisdictions, we are uniquely uniquely impacted the most. And, and I so, think that's I think the relationship is strong enough that I need to talk through. But they feel comfortable with working with us on doing what I tell you where to go. Now that you've introduced that, if you say you're okay with that, if I can work it out with them, I'll pursue that. But I don't want to tell you yes without talking to them. The front end of your question is uh, we you know, we've progressively, I think, tried to be included in as many conversations. I mean, even with the CAO, the new one, uh, even she expressed some interesting thoughts about this being an afterthought and why won't we invite it to the table earlier uh, to these. So we're complaining that the you know, cards we've been dealt and she's doing a great job of trying to work with us. Uh, even we got working through with GRTC, they like, oh, where they cut off and they're trying to work through that and where the kids will be able to get there. So the best I can tell you is uh, I will pursue that. Not an initial shortened day. I know we have so many hours we need to make sure that they get in. Uh, Mr. Coleman is already in his connection with Almighty. Told us we would have 11 days of snow <laughs> next year. Almighty. <laughs> 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 then we, we won't have another winter like that. So I will make the phone call tomorrow. And I guess what are we doing from uh, here, assuming kids are in, in school? From a programming perspective, you know, are we trying to at least connect? The best out of this and incorporating the maybe teaching kids about the white race. Oh, we got a number of yeah, yeah. We got pictures to show you where kids, schools have gotten in it. One of the PDs is given by a number of our staff on how to include the bike piece into instruction. So absolutely there's been an effort to try to 
to include people made flags and the other things. Like, like in the to see the bike races come to our school. They have a, Washington? Uh, we actually paired every school with one of the international teams so that they're able to follow a team and track the race and monitor their players and kind of do some background information on things like that. As well as DOE put out a wealth of resources that tie our curriculum to the bike race in ways that we can study and understand it in the school. So we're full steam ahead in making sure that the schools are partnering with and making this a learning activity. So, so I would ask Mr. Coleman and the board if motion is authorized to the Friday off the early release and my ability to work with VOE to try and find non-traditional plan for those days. Uh, so I because I don't have a chance to come back to you to just inform you. We all do it that way. And when the roads close, is that when the bike races are over, right? And it's still getting the 245, but they don't open the roads back up Right, because what they have to do is you've got to get every, all the participants out, you get all the teams out. But we, we work very closely with RPD, and I want to I want to thank RPD because they have worked with us extremely well. There are checkpoints that they will allow me to get buses through. The challenge, though, with the checkpoints, as Dr. Bedden alluded to, is our parents. They're going to let a bus get through that checkpoint, but parents are going to have to go around. And can I get around at all? Even myself, you know, who, who's not a native, I can get around most of the race course, but it's going to take, it's going to take time. Okay, so, so I think the, the conversation about other options for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, where they're really, it's probably good ones to consider. Um, obviously, we'll always gun shy too, because of the 11 snow days and madness on there. But it's a point well taken. Um, well, like we work with RPD, RPD just recently when I spoke to the chief last week about the school incidents that happened. Because we deploy people from multiple locations. So we've asked them to develop a plan. We'll work with face staff. We'll probably have to change their schedules and deploy teams of north and south teams to let them stay rather than all the workload to, to serve the schools. So we have an immediate response team to get to schools while other people are trying to get there. Because they won't be able to get there. They don't have to go around. So it's going to be interesting dynamic. Uh, police are sure as they get there uh, to help. But our staff will have a challenge if there's a major incident. Okay, so can we get a motion? Challenges the structural time that keeps getting lost, right? Is what we so. And the reason I, I asked for the motion where you did, we need to go back and figure out what those impact is and what would Monday, Tuesday look like because now you're eating up those hours now exactly. if we hit snow days. Exactly. So I didn't want to 
say, yeah, we could, because then the state ultimately decides if you miss those days, whether you have a state of emergency to waive or those types of things. So the way your motion is, it lets me talk it through with them. Okay. So we'll go back and calculate the options and then see where we are and then have the what if. What if we had these 11 days and then we have this issue? Now we're getting in a place where we are. But again, it's also putting our teachers in a disadvantage with contact time. Exactly. So, so I think Mr. Boren's point was not to have off Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but if there's a modified schedule, potentially, that we can do, because we're still not even wanting them to school. Because we also got to balance the number. Our, our parents depend on us to have kids in schools so that they go to work, too. So we, exactly. all, we're feeding. Every time the kid's out of school, they miss meals. So we're trying to balance. So we, we actually need time to walk through all that routine. Okay. And I just wanted to put on the record that I would like to um, not move forward without parents having somebody to say or input. How this is, I don't want to just be the board making decisions. The superintendent makes fine to make it happen, and the parents haven't been consulted and given the time to give it. I understand you, but the problem is going to be the longer we tell them, the more challenging it is to <coughs> parents because you're talking about September 18th. Is it? Is yes, it? sir. It starts September 18th. So that, that's going to be a challenge. Yeah, I just I don't know if I would be entirely comfortable with my child personally at, at the high school this kind of time with the level of rigor that she has in her classes. I wouldn't feel comfortable with her that kind of time straight away, especially with the A B block schedule. You're already already only going to those classes every other day, and to have all of that time at one time that would be a tremendous And I would say that's a valid concern. So one of what you would. I would say is we also got to talk about what type of instruction we can make available to them while they're not there. So that's a good point. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Question. 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 Are we closed? This question. She called a question.
Are you do you have a PowerPoint? No. You don't? No. Any more PowerPoint presentation? No. No? Okay, you can go back to us. Come on, the way Federal government required training. You need to be in your seats.
from August 31st through September 3rd. And as well as I, the one thing I am most proud about is we've had hosted 17 mandatory parent orientation and we've had 510 families come through that orientation. We have been stressing to families that preschool is real school, that this is the beginning of their educational journey. Parents are excited, they are ready, and we just look forward to the school year. And that is my report. Any questions? Ms. Arsenal, yes. um, for the uh, four-year-olds, has there been any conversation with you or any communication with you that any of those children could be potentially tested to see if they could move on to kindergarten if their birthday is before December 31st? I had some at the end of this school year in June, and I think I've had maybe one parent that I was told about that their kid was tested. I haven't received any more names. Okay. But is that anything that you would be a part of helping to coordinate? Normally what happens is if Ms. Kane and was Ms. Perkins, they give me the name of the parent, we coordinated the teachers to perform that testing. Okay. That so was my work. So we wouldn't automatically test our four year olds that we know that that are in this Head Start program that they have a birthday that falls before December thirty first. The parent has to make that request. Yes. Okay. I'm colleagues, I have had the great honor and privilege of attending uh, the Head Start Policy Council meetings and uh, the level of participation by parents, uh, the professional way the meetings are conducted. Uh, this has really been encouraging to me and Sansa and the team are doing an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you very much.
The next item is to receive proposed revisions to policy 1-2.5 and policy 1-5.8 of the policy of bylaw section of the policy. Ms. Lee. Just briefly, I was also posted on board docs, I believe uh, the clerk also sent it to you via email. Policy 1-1, excuse me, 1-2.5, 1-5.8 were revised to, in light of the conversations regarding the time frame, to clear up some language that was um, put there in anticipation of you all having a division-wide uh, or school board bucket of money um, that's not divided that way, so that language was deleted. The new proposed timeline is 21 days um, regarding your request in advance of meeting funds, 21 days. Um, it talks about the required form that you have to use and also provides that <coughs> requests are not submitted in accordance with the policies that are proposed, then they will not be processed um, for consideration or for approval by the school board. I mean, that would, go, that would be the same for reimbursements as well. This is the first read, and if you have questions regarding work, um, any questions or comments, please provide me with those within a week of today, um, so by the 15th. And then that way, your second read would be on the 28th, and um, we expect you to vote at that particular time. Okay, thank you very much. Well, Again, everyone, if you have any updates or you would like to um, some revisions to those policy, you need to have that to by Monday the 15th. Okay, Madam Clerk. The next item is uh, item 5, your board action items 5.01 received for action and human resources actions. <laughs> Good evening again, board members here. Um, HR actions for tonight include the nomination of 85 employees, the change of contract of 90 employees, the transfer of 18 employees, and HR actions for information include the resignation of 27 employees, the rescission of employment of 6 employees, retirement of 6 employees, change of name of 4 employees, the reappointment of 16 employees, the furlough of two employees, and the returning of leave of two employees. And also, since the information was sent to you, you have an addendum item tonight, which includes an additional nomination and an additional change of contract. Okay, we will finish your discussion. Okay. Yeah, right.
want to discuss with respect to candidates for employment and assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, promotion, salary, discipline, and resignation, and school division, including consideration of human resources in the state, school board employee performance evaluation and employee match 151608, 